Okay guys, so I'm going to go ahead and knock out this uh, video tonight. Um, just going to go ahead and explain the registers. There's really one, two, three, four registers. Um, and it's really easy. It shouldn't take long because it's only really two of them or three that I have to go over in detail. Um, and yeah, and then so then after this, we'll go ahead and jump into the code. Um, so let's look at that now. Oops. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, first things first, uh, I didn't go over interrupts. So, uh, these are just, uh, these are all the interrupts it has for the SPI. Um, when the, uh, TX buffer is ready to be loaded, when you have data on the RX buffer, when there's been a master mode fault event, if you remember, I told you that has to do when you have a uh, more than one master. And then for some reason, that line that they're signaling each other on goes low. <clears throat> That's what that is. And an overrun, a CRC, and a uh, TI frame format error, which obviously we won't use. And these are interrupt events. Uh, these are the flags that correspond to these interrupts. These flags always occur. Um, but then you can actually enable the actual interrupt request to occur by enabling these uh these control bits in the uh, registers. So let's go ahead and look at the registers then. So the first register, let's uh, make this a little smaller here, is control register one, obviously. Um, so let's start at the top. Um, bidirectional mode, um, this basically you're telling it if it's going to be in half duplex or full duplex. So by setting a one here, you're telling it you're gonna use one line and it's going to be bi-directional. So in other words, one line and the data is going to go um, both ways. And if you remember my earlier explanation, that's basically half duplex. If you're going to use full duplex, then you just leave this bit alone and just leave it at zero and it'll um, do that. Um, I'll put enable for bi-directional mode. Um, so when you put, um, excuse me, uh, this bit combined with BDI mode with this one selects the direction of the data transfer in bidirectional mode. So obviously if you're using half duplex and you're using just one line to send data and to receive data at any given moment, you can only do one thing. So you have to tell it um, every time you're going to change, you're going to disable the output and become a receiver only. And then when you want to transmit data, you um, enable the output and then you become a transmitter, right? So you constantly have to be changing this um, depending on what you're doing um, at that given moment um, since there's, there's only one line for communication. Um, this enables the CRC calculation for the SPI. I didn't go over that, but I do go over CRC and another of my earlier videos from a couple of months ago. Again, this bit also has to do with the CRC. <clears throat> data format, again, the um, SPI does allow for 16-bit data frames. So you can choose that by uh, setting a 1 in this bit. Um, this RX only enable, uh, mode enable. Um, again, if you... This is basically how you would set the microcontroller in simplex mode and to be just a receiver. So to do that, you actually have to clear this BDI mode bit, which is this one. You have to clear it, make it a zero, but that tells it to be two line unidirectional. So that's almost like a contradiction that you're going to use simplex mode, which is only one line, but it's telling you to clear it here. Um, I guess that has something to, to do with the way the hardware works internally, but all you have to do is obviously obey the data sheet. Even though that other mode says that zero, that clearing it means two lines. However, here it says, well, if you want to use one line, um, a simplex communication, you still have to clear that bit for some reason. So you just have to kind of obey that it's saying that. Um, so then you would clear that bit and you would activate this one and you would get this sort of simplex uh, communication mode where you're just receiving data. 
And obviously if you're not using this mode, then this would be a zero. And then you can transmit and receive. <clears throat> this SSM bit, uh, we went over, this is where you would select your uh, software or hardware management for your, um, your NSS pin. So here it says that if it's a zero, uh, software management is disabled, which in turn means that hardware management is enabled and vice versa for this pin. Now, um, this SSI bit um, is affected only when this bit is oops, when this bit is set. When the SSM bit, why does it keep doing that? When this SSM bit is set. So when you have software management, uh, slave management enabled, that means that the um, actual GPI, the little pin for the um, slave select, you're gonna control it with your software with GPIO pins. So then it's telling you that um, in that case, the value of this bit is forced onto the NSS pin and the IO value of the NSS pin is uh, ignored, right? Because obviously since you're using software management, it needs to ignore the input or output value that's on that um, MSS bit. Uh, I hope that makes sense. It's confusing, um, but don't worry because you don't you don't have to do like set this bit ever or anything with it. Either it's gonna do it um, or not by hardware mode. Um, where are we at? LSB. Again, this is your um. Um, if you're going to transmit your most significant bit first, which is the most common way to do it, or if you're going to transmit your uh, least significant bit first. Um, so yeah, but for the most part, you'll probably be using this. So then you would just leave that as is. And obviously, this is to enable the SPI peripheral. And here you would select your baud rate. How fast do you want the SPI to uh, communication to go? Um, you can take your peripheral clock and divide it by two, four, all the way up to 256. Now, <clears throat> you also have to be mindful of which SPI you're using. For example, in my chip that I'm using, the L0, there's only one SPI and it operates at the same, um, I mean, the clock for that peripheral is at the same speed as the chip itself, which is 32 megahertz. So then this would be 32 megahertz divided by two or by four or by eight, whatever. However, if you're using the F1 series, and let's say you're using it at uh, 72 megahertz or whatever you're using it, um, you have to be mindful which SPI you're, uh, you're using because it could probably be on the APB1 bus and that bus usually runs at half the speed of um whatever um other the other clocks are doing so if, if you have for example here it won't let me put it to um to 72 because the max is 36 uh, megahertz for that so if for example if you're on the f1 and you're using spi1 that is on the apb2 bus uh apb2 bus is oh I can't see it. APB2 is your APB2 bus, um, and the peripheral clocks are running at 72, so that's the same speed, right? However, if you're using any other SPI on the F1, like SPI2 or SPI3, that runs on APB1 bus. APB1 bus is right here. That one, your peripheral clocks are not running at the same speed as your as your core, right? unless you put your core also at 36 and then set this prescaler to divide by one, then yeah, it'll run at the same speed of your core. So you want to be mindful of, um, you know, don't just think off the bat that the peripheral clock is the same clock as your, uh, your core because it can be, but it's not always the case. <clears throat> um, and here, obviously, you're selecting whether your SPI is going to be a slave or a master. And this is uh, what I went into detail about one of my other videos, 
where you're going to select the clock polarity or the clock phase. And ultimately, I told you guys that this really just depends on the device that you're, commun you're communicating with and what kind of SPI protocol it's expecting. All right, uh, the register two. Well, first let's look at uh, interrupts or the status register rather. Um, so here um, it's just telling you there's a frame error, but this is not even used um, in SPI. I mean, it's used. I mean, it's not used in SPI, in regular SPI mode. This is used for um, SPI TI mode and I2S mode. So we don't have to worry about that bit. And the seventh bit just tells us that the SPI peripheral is busy. It's either um, receiving something or the TX buffer is not empty. So it's busy. Um, and then there's an overrun error. This basically happens when, um, well, here, if you click on here, it'll tell you exactly what it means. Um, when the master or the slave completes the reception of the next data while the read operation of the previous frame um, has not completed. So in other words, if you have data in your Rx and you haven't read it yet, but before you even read it, new data comes in, well, you just lost some data. So that's an overrun error. Um, the next bit is a mode fault. And again, this happens when you have two masters communicating via the uh, S NSS pin and a GPIO pin. And, um, for some, and, um, the line is pulled low when it should be high during a, uh, master communication. Um, you can go ahead and, and review, uh, I think, yeah, the previous video I went into that. Um, and uh, that's what the mode fault is. So when that condition happens, this uh, flag will go off. And these two are, I mean, this one is again for uh, CRC stuff, underrun error. And again, you can go over here and it's going to tell you what that means. Um, basically, slave transmission mode flag is set when the first clock. Okay, so this is that um, your, clock, your first clock for data transmission appears. While the software has not yet loaded anything into the um, data register. So if it starts clocking um, before any data um, starts appearing, that means it has nothing to set. Therefore, it's going to give you that uh, underrun error. Uh, oops, I keep going to the top. Mm -hmm. The next one is not used for SPI mode. It has to do, I think, with that audio thing channel left channel right so yeah that's probably has to do with the um that alternate audio protocol that it supports um and then this just tells you that your txe buffer is empty so you're ready to load data into the spi so it can transmit this tells you that you've received data on your um shift register your buffer so um this tells you when it's not empty basically our receive buffer not empty and that's your status register. Um, so all those, all these errors, um, they can also um, generate interrupts. And that's where you would go to the control register too, where you would enable these bits so that when those flags are set, when these flags happen, like this busy or this overrun, uh, an interrupt request is generated. So then you can handle that event in your code. So for example, if you want an interrupt um, to happen when the TXE buffer is empty, then you would put a one here. Same thing for the RX not empty. Um, or when there's been an error and the error can be any one of the errors that were described in the other one in the other, um, um, register. So it's not like you're going to know exactly which error, well, you can know which error if, um, you enable this interrupt, so you know, there's been an error. So once you get in into that error handling routine, you check your status registers to figure out exactly which error it was. Um, frame format error. This has to do with these two, um, um, SPI modes, uh, three is not used. It says output enable. Um, this has to do with uh, multi-master configuration. Um, it says SS output is disabled in master mode. And the cell can work in multi-master com configuration. Mm, so again, we're talking about that slave select line. 
and if here the output is enabled um, the cell cannot work in multi-master um, commun uh, environment so remember I told you that to set that in order to use that NSS pin as a um, way to communicate to another master multi-master that there is currently a master on the line you would have to take that SS pin or the NSS pin I mean and set it into input mode um, so this is what this does right here it sets it into input mode by either enabling or disabling the output and this has to be to do with DMA um, and again I'll get into that when I do eventually um, do the DMA portion of this uh, thing of this peripheral and uh, we just did the status register and then the next register just your data register which again has 16 bits for either 8-bit uh, data communication or 16-bit uh, data communication and then the other registers uh, 1, 2, and 3 over here have to do with um, CRC um, and then these two have to do with um, I, that I2S audio stuff and that's it so basically you have register 1, 2, status register and your data register right and that's all you have to use to um, get your SPI to work and when you really think about it the only settings that you need to configure are here and this is it this other register just to enable interrupts if you want them or not this one is just to check the status of stuff and then the other one is just your data register so you have just one simple register for uh, configuring your SPI everything from the baud rate to the um, you know the the clock polarity and master mode by direct everything you need is in one register so that's uh, that's pretty helpful um, so yeah guys that's that's gonna be it really for the uh, register overviews as you can see it's basically one register for settings um, two registers for status and interrupts and then your data register um, it really is that easy I may or may not do the other video on coding tonight so I might get to that tomorrow um, and upload that but uh, depending when you're watching this it might already be there so anyways guys enjoy um, I'll see you in the next video Peace.